Our basic rights to exist rely on what we are able to eat, drink, and breathe. If any of these three components are compromised, then so is our health. If organizations such as the WHO, the FDA, and the EPA are in place to watch over our health, then why are there so many toxins in our air, water, and food supplies? For example, after the Fukushima disaster, the EPA raised the toxicity levels of how much radiation is acceptable to the human body. We are all economic slaves to a broken system of fiat currency. We work 40 plus hours a week, 50 plus weeks a year, until we're old enough to retire, but are too elderly to fully enjoy our golden years. The best years of our lives were given to the same global corporations who have kept us financially enslaved. Ask yourself this, if there was no such thing as money, what would you be doing with your life? After having fun or traveling, eventually you'll want to do something. Your answer will often lead you to your life purpose. Eugenics is defined as the study of belief in the possibility of improving the qualities of the human species or a human population, especially by such means as discouraging reproduction by persons having genetic defects or presumed to have inheritable, undesirable traits, or encouraging reproduction by persons presumed to have inheritable, desirable traits. It's become obvious that there is a eugenics program in place in order to cull the world's population through the poisoning of our food, water, and air supplies. While water is the world's most precious commodity, it is also a basic right for all of humanity. In 2003, a United Nations report predicted that by the middle of the century, in the worst case, 7 billion people in 60 countries could be faced with water scarcity. Our planet is covered with more than two-thirds of it being water, but fresh water is only about 2.5% of it, while the rest is salt water. Out of the available fresh water, two-thirds of it is locked in glaciers and in permanent snow cover. The available fresh water can be found in lakes, rivers, aquifers, and rainoff and rainfall runoff. How long can you go without water? As Mahatma Gandhi proved in the 1940s, the body can go more than three weeks without food, but because the human body is at least compromised of 60% water, it needs water to function properly. At the maximum, depending on the conditions, one week would be the longest period you could go without water, but for most people, it would only be three to four days. In the most optimal of conditions, where the temperature stayed around 70 degrees, which is about 21 Celsius, it's possible that one could survive up to 12 days without food or water. Conversely, if the temperature was significantly warmer, then surviving without water may only last several days, even if you were to be sitting in the shade. In extreme heat, the human body can lose up to 1.5 liters of water per hour through sweat. The consumption of alcohol would cause quicker dehydration due to excessive urination. But this only addresses the need for water and not what is in our drinking supply. In some areas of the United States, such as Utah, Washington, or Colorado, it is illegal to trap your own rainwater or to divert water from a stream or river into a holding reservoir. While drilling for your own water supply through the local aquifer would be preferred, most people are reliant upon city drinking water, which does not filter out many of the pharmaceuticals that are in it through urination and limited filtering processes along with the addition of fluoride to the drinking water in some countries. John, is it true or false that sodium fluoride is a basic ingredient in rat poison? I think it's fair to say that sodium fluoride is contained in a rat poison, and I think it's also fair to say that it's contained in tea. Uh, what comparison you wish to draw from that statement will be up to you to draw it. Uh, it is an ingredient of rat poison. Doctor, no. is sodium fluoride in water any more dangerous than iodine and salt, Dr. Dunn? 
We believe that sodium fluoride in water in the proper proportions is in no way dangerous or harmful to health. Why then are you determined to force this on the people without a vote? Uh, I don't think I am prepared to force anything on people because I have no legislative authority to do anything. I will but the citizens aren't intelligent enough to decide for themselves whether they want a rat poison shoveled into their drinking water. <laughs> is that right? Doctor, I'm 57 years old. How old are you? I'm 33. I've got all my teeth. How many have you got? Uh, I have them all except third molars, which just all weren't positioned. Well, I haven't all of mine. Mine were knocked out in a car crash long ago. But I don't know what that is proving. <laughs> no, it doesn't prove anything. It proves that I was brought up by cleaning my teeth and not by taking rat poison in my water. So I've got my teeth. In an article published by the Associated Press, it was stated that pharmaceuticals have been found in 24 metropolitan cities, including antidepressant medications, anti-seizure medications, anti-inflammatory medications, painkillers, and even caffeine. Additionally, the Associated Press revealed that the drinking water of at least 41 million people in the United States is contaminated with pharmaceutical drugs. A study by the U.S. Geological Survey, published in the journal Scientific Reports, found that birth control drugs were found in unfiltered tap water, which could cause a possible widespread infertility epidemic in the coming years. Big Pharma is not in the business of finding cures because there is no money to be made without repeat business through prescriptions that constantly need to be refilled. The human body absorbs and expels these pharmaceuticals, which ultimately end up in our water supplies. Despite filtration processes at the water plants, pharmaceuticals continue to be found in our drinking water. One has to think about the consequences this has to all forms of water life, both fresh water and salt water, along with anything that consumes tap water, such as humans, pets, or plants. For many countries, the allowable level of fluoride in drinking water is 1.5 milligrams per liter. This is an arbitrary number that has never been proven to be safe. In fact, even trace amounts of fluoride have been shown to be a functional liability to the nervous system. As reported by Christina Sarich on Natural News, the CDC states that the EPA's enforceable standard for fluoride in public water supplies is 4.0 milligrams per liter. But this far exceeds any safe amount of fluoride that we should be drinking. A Russian study entitled The Effect of Small Quantities of Fluorine on the Human Body concluded that low concentrations of fluorine in drinking water 1.5 milligrams per liter, cause changes to developing tissues and harms the development of higher neural activity in humans and animals. Fluoride is commonly found in water supplies, toothpaste, and mouthwash, but you will also find it in processed foods made with tap water. Fluoride is a poisonous waste that is so toxic that it cannot be directly dumped into the ocean or any water supply. If you look at the back of any fluoridated toothpaste, you will find a warning saying that if you swallow a pea-sized amount of toothpaste, you are supposed to call the Poison Control Center. According to Dr. Bill Osmundson, a pea-sized amount of fluoride is found in every small 8-ounce glass of fluoridated tap water. The following is a brief history of fluoride. While this greatly pertains to the United States, you'll also see why other countries need to be concerned as it's also being put into our air supplies. 1931, fluoride in drinking water is found to be the cause of brown teeth, now known as dental fluorosis. 1931, H. Trendley Dean of the United States Public Health Service initiates studies on fluorides under the jurisdiction of Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon. Mellon is founder of Alcoa Aluminum, who is one of the main suppliers of toxic sodium fluoride as a byproduct of aluminum manufacturing. He publishes a purposely skewed study showing that fluoride results in the reduction of tooth decay. 1940, Soviet concentration camps were maintained by fluoride administration to inmates 
to decrease resistance to authority and induce physical deterioration. 1943, the Journal of the American Medical Association on September 18, 1943, states, Fluorides are general protoplasmic poisons. 1944, Oscar Ewing is put on the payroll of the Aluminum Company of America, Alcoa, as an attorney at an annual salary of $750,000. Within a few months, Ewing was made Federal Security Administrator with the announcement that he was taking a big cut in salary. The U.S. Public Health Service, then a division of the FSA, comes under the command of Ewing and he begins to vigorously promote fluoridation nationwide. A byproduct of aluminum manufacturing is toxic. Ewing's public relations strategist for the fluoride campaign was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, Edward L. Bernays. Bernays conducts a public relations campaign to promote fluorine ingestion by applying Freudian theory to induce public acceptance. It was one of Bernays' most successful campaigns. 1950. Soviets add fluoride to water in prison systems to maintain subservience in the inmate population. 1952. The American Dental Association publishes an issue of its journal instructing its dentists not to discuss their personal opinions about fluoride. 1954. A study is published which links fluorides and the development of cancer in animals. 1958. In October 1958, Dr. J.F. Montague, a medical doctor, published material reflecting his growing concern over fluoridation in the Journal of the International College of Surgeons connecting the presence of fluorine in the human body to cancer. 1960, the American Dental Association issued a pamphlet for public consumption called Fluoridation Facts, Answers to Criticism of Fluoridation. In defense of the use of toxic fluoride compounds in public water supplies, which is a grievous crime against humanity since it means mandated involuntary public medication, they used the logic that people have been known to live a ripe old age in areas the water supply is fluoridated. Unfortunately, they neglected to mention that the addition of fluoride to the water supply correlated directly with the number of stillbirths, mongoloid children, brittle teeth and enlarged dental root structures, adverse spinal conditions, osteomalacia, which is the softening of bones, and osteoporosis, which is abnormally porous and spaced structure inside of bone, in the medicated population as opposed to controlled populations that were unmedicated. 1963. A study is published which links fluoride and the development of cancer in animals. 1971. Germany bans water fluoridation. 1977. The Congressional Subcommittee on Intergovernmental Relations convenes two full congressional hearings on the subject of fluorides. During the hearing, it was proven that, one, the scientific efforts of those promoting fluoridation were fraudulent, and two, other existing studies proved beyond a doubt that approximately 10,000 excess cancer deaths per year could be attributed to fluoridation in the United States. 1977. Congressional Representative L. H. Fountain, chairman of the 1977 subcommittee hearings on fluoride, states that the carcinogenic nature of fluoride remains unanswered and orders the U.S. Public Health Service to conduct animal studies to see if fluoride causes cancer. Dr. Herman Craybill from the National Cancer Institute, who in 1972 had been chosen by NCI to write a memo stating that fluorides do not cause cancer, was placed in charge of these studies. Craybill boldly states, this will be the final study to confirm negativity of fluoride ions in carcinogenesis. He cites 13 studies having nothing to do with the subject of fluorides and cancer in order to support his claim that no link between fluorides and cancer existed. NCI director Dr. Arthur Upton later admitted that 13 studies had nothing to do with the subject of the study. 1979. In order to counteract the tide of truth on fluorides, the American Dental Association issues a white paper on fluoridation. It characterizes opponents of public water fluoridation as uninformed, self-styled experts whose qualifications for speaking out on such a scientific issue as fluoridation were practically non-existent or whose motivation was self-serving. 1979 
The January 20th edition of the New York Times carries a story in which a child was killed because of a lethal dose of fluoride at a city dental clinic. The parents were awarded $750,000. 1979. On November 11th, up to 50 parts per million fluoride was dumped into the Annapolis, Maryland water supply resulting in the poisoning of 50,000 people. Many died of heart failure during the week following the spill. Despite all of this, in 1990, the American Dental Association issues a press release which states, Water fluoridation remains the safest, most effective, and most economical public health measure to reduce tooth decay. 1990. The National Toxicology Program, in February 1990, releases its pathological data tables with a cover letter which, in a turnabout, claims, there has not been any evidence that shows a relationship between fluoridation and cancer or any other diseases in humans. And, water fluoridation has proven highly effective in improving the nation's dental health by markedly reducing tooth decay. The National Toxicology Report, issued in March, omitted all studies which showed genetic damage from fluorides, and important studies showing that fluorides induced tumors and cancers were ignored. Robert Carton, Ph.D., formerly president of the Union of Governmental Scientists, working at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, said, Water fluoridation is the greatest case of scientific fraud of this century, if not of all time. In the journal, Clinical Toxicology of Commercial Products, 5th edition, 1984, it is stated that there is not a single scientific or laboratory study from anywhere in the world which proves that fluoridation reduces tooth decay in humans. There are, however, hundreds of published scientific papers which show that water fluoridation is dangerous to human, animal, plant, and aquatic life, which is no surprise since fluoride is more toxic than lead and only marginally less so than arsenic. You can find out a lot more about this article in The Hidden History of Fluoride on www.bodymindsoulspirit.com. A 2003 study by the nonprofit Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, found that due to a combination of pollutant deteriorating equipment and pipes, the public water supplies in 19 of America's largest cities delivered drinking water that contained contaminant levels exceeding EPA limits, either legal limits or unenforceable suggested limits, and may pose health risks to some residents. So even though it may test fine at its source, public water may still pick up contaminants on the way to your house. Contaminants that sneaked into city water supplies studied by the NRDC included rocket fuel, arsenic, lead, fecal waste, and chemical byproducts created during water treatment. Bottled water isn't necessarily the answer because it has its own issues. A four-year study conducted by the nonprofit National Resources Defense Council, NRDC, in 1999 found that bottled water regulations are inadequate to assure consumers of either purity or safety. Bottled water is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, while the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, oversees tap water standards. The FDA testing for bottled water is more lax than the EPA's testing for public water. FDA testing for bottled water is more lax than EPA testing for public water. Tests are conducted less often and for fewer contaminants. For example, the FDA does not mandate testing of bottled water for cryptosporidium, a parasite that poses serious health threats to those with weakened immune systems and to the elderly. Tap water is regularly tested for cryptosporidium. The NRDC study authors also tested 1,000 bottled water supplies from 103 brands and found that one-third contained contaminants that exceeded FDA mandated levels. The NRDC website states that even when bottled waters are covered by the FDA's specific bottled water standards, those rules are weaker in many ways than EPA rules that apply to big city tap water. City tap water can have no confirmed E. coli or fecal coliform bacteria. 
FDA bottled water rules include no such prohibition, meaning a certain amount of any type of coliform bacteria is allowed in bottled water. Bottled water plants must test for coliform bacteria just once a week. Big city tap water must be tested 100 or more times a month. Cities generally must test at least once a quarter for many chemical contaminants. Water bottlers generally must test only annually. Cities must have their water tested by government certified labs. Such certified testing is not required for bottlers. Tap water test results and notices of violations must be reported to state or federal officials. There is no mandatory reporting for water bottlers. The NRDC found that one-fourth of bottled water is actually just tap water with or without extra filtration. FDA rules allows bottlers to label their water spring water even though it may be treated with chemicals or mechanically pumped to the surface and there's no guarantee that the spring itself is a pure one. One brand of spring water traced to its source by the NRDC came from a spring that bubbled up into an industrial parking lot adjacent to a hazardous waste site. For more information about bottled water standards, please visit the NRDC website. In the upcoming years, water could become more precious than gold if we cannot find a way to provide the world with clean drinking water. In Kenya, a massive underground lake was found that could supply the country with fresh water for up to 70 years. In an article published in Science Magazine, a huge underground reservoir was recently discovered 400 miles below the Earth's surface that contains three times as much water as all of our oceans combined. Additionally, huge freshwater aquifers have been discovered underneath the ocean floors are believed to exist in Australia, China, North America, and South Africa. In a recent development, a team from MIT discovered a way to use solar panels to charge a cache of batteries which powers an, an electrodialysis machine that removes salt from the water and makes it perfectly drinkable. So between the aquifers, lakes, and reservoirs that are located beneath the Earth's surface, along with the newly discovered invention of converting salt water into drinking water, there should be no excuse as to why clean drinking water cannot be enjoyed by everyone on this planet. If you don't have your own well water, then invest in a quality water filter that will remove as many toxic ingredients from your water as possible. There are many different types of water filters, so be sure to get one that works best for your particular water concerns. There isn't one specific water filter that will remove every contaminant from your water supply, but you can remove a significant amount of these contaminants with the right filter. The best type of filter to remove chlorine and its byproducts is a combination of carbon KDF, which stands for kinetic degradation fluxion, adsorption filter, not to be confused with absorption which range from shower and faucet filters to sink and whole house filters. A regular carbon filter won't remove chloramine, so look for a catalytic carbon filter instead. You also want to be sure to change your water filter as often as possible because these can become a haven for bacteria. You can also file fluoride complaints at the local and federal levels. Dr. Masaro Emoto's research into water concluded that positive thoughts and intentions can physically change the structure of your water. You can also add ozone into your drinking water for added protection. You may even consider combining positive thoughts and intentions with the ozone for a supercharged water. Lastly, activism is one of the best ways to be heard. For example, you can write to your congressman and let him know how displeased you are about the fluoridation of water and alert that particular person about the dangers of fluoride. Call and ask your water utility company if it uses chlorine, which is a suspected respiratory and neurological toxin, or chloramine, which is a suspected blood and respiratory toxin. Chlorine combines with organic elements during the water treatment process to produce carcinogenic byproducts.